This is Classical Ideas with Greg Soden. Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. Teaching about religion in a public school in the United States is rewarding but very difficult. It is not hyperbolic to say that one moment everything is going fine and students are learning a lot, and the next the class is on the news and steeped in controversy. If you don't believe me, do an internet search using the term Gate. Or look up the story of a Wellesley, Massachusetts, 6th grade class who visited a mosque on a field trip in Boston in 2010. In 2015, a school district in Virginia canceled all classes in December 2015 after a controversy erupted from a teacher asking students to copy Arabic calligraphy, which just happened to recite the Shahada, the Muslim statement of faith and one of the pillars of Islam. Another example is a Florida school district that found itself mired in controversy over a guest speaker from the Council of American Islamic Relations, CARE for short. When teaching about religion, interaction is crucial. Many guests I've had on Classical Ideas have visited my very own classroom in Columbia, Missouri, and have had long, hour-plus long conversations with my students. We've had difficult and immensely interesting conversations, but controversy was never far from my mind in any of these situations. As I said, one minute everything is fine, the next it's not. A couple of years ago, I was getting ready for knee surgery and I saw a book called Faith Ed, Teaching About Religion in an Age of Intolerance by journalist Linda K. Wartimer, which was about to be released by Beacon Press. I spontaneously hit the buy now button and read the book while immobilized post-surgery. To say I was amazed, shocked, intrigued, and informed that all my worst teaching nightmares could very much come true instantaneously is an understatement. The book is fantastic, and it tells the backstory of most of the examples I listed moments ago. So I'm pleased today to announce author and journalist Linda K. Wartimer, author of Faith Ed, Teaching About Religion in an Age of Intolerance, as my guest on Classical Ideas. We get into the weeds of teaching about religion in 2018 society in the United States. This was a blast, so without further delay, here's my conversation with Linda K. Wartimer, author of Faith Ed. Linda, thank you so much for coming on the show. Greg, thank you so much for having me. So can you introduce yourself a little bit and your work kind of give the audience an elevator spiel about who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. So as you said, I'm Linda K. Wertheimer, and I like to use the K because people often confuse me with a more famous Linda of NPR, and that is not me. Gotcha. (laughs) Um, Okay. Um, I am a veteran journalist. I got my start in the newspaper world. I actually wrote my first published articles for a newspaper when I was 16. And I was in my, uh, I grew up in Ohio and I wrote for two little papers there and went to Northwestern and spent about 25 years working full time for major metro newspapers. I was primarily an education reporter that entire time, not almost the whole time. And my last full time gig was as the education editor at the Boston Globe, where I oversaw a team of reporters. But then always I've never stopped writing. And what I would say is, you know, my background is it's, you know, investigative journalism, it, you know, it's digging up stories, but I've also always enjoyed doing narrative stories and getting in the lives of people and telling their stories. And after I took a buyout from the glow, I also got interested in writing about religion, which I never really wrote that much about when I was in the newspapers. And I sort of started with writing personal stories about getting closer to my Jewish faith. I wrote a story about the adult bat mitzvah movement. 
And then I got in, I was always interested in separation of church and state issues. So that sort of evolved into me writing faith ed. Um, so I'm, so I, you know, I'm a journalist. I give a lot of talks now about teaching about religion in the public schools. I write a lot of commentaries. I teach writing and I teach journalism. So I wear a lot of different hats. Excellent. And I found your work because, as any listener of this show will know, I teach about religion with high school students in Missouri. And that's how I found your book a few years ago. The title just jumped out at me whenever I was, you know, looking for books related to the things that I teach every day. Um, How did you come to specifically think about classroom teaching about religion like what was that moment that like really snagged you into the story of like how teachers teach about religion so it's that this is actually going to be a two-pronged answer okay um the the first prong is it was a, a new a new story in the boston globe that caught my attention um there was a headline about wellesley middle school and they had gone on a field trip to a local mosque and the headline was something like you know controversy over mosque field trip erupts at Wellesley Middle School. And I read the article and I was fascinated because within the article it said, well, they were doing it as part of a field trip for their sixth grade class, which studies the religion, you know, studies world religions from January to June. And and they look at Christianity, Judaism, Islam and Judaism. And I'm from a generation that didn't have that. You know, I so that I was like, wow, I wonder First of all, I was fascinated that there was a controversy and also sad that there was a controversy and I wanted to look more into it. Secondly, when I grew was growing up in Ohio, uh, so I we moved to Ohio from New York State when I was nine and I was the only Jew in my class and the only Jew in the school other than my two brothers and this lady would come in and teach religious classes about Christianity mm-hmm. and so we were preached at. And it caused a lot of issues for me from like age nine till I graduated from high school because kids then, you know, I got excused from the class and they'd say, why? And I'd say, well, I'm Jewish. They said, well, what's that? Are you going to go to hell or you're going to go to hell because you don't believe in Jesus? And so that was a huge sort of black mark (laughs) on my childhood. You know, it like really affected me. And I always wondered, and we never learned about each other's religions. Religion was a dividing line. It was like, if you weren't Christian, you were strange and different. And to me, it was like, if someone was Christian, were they okay with me being Jewish? You know, so I didn't learn about them. They didn't learn about me. And so I always wondered if they had taught us about different religions, could it have made a difference? So you combine those two things together, the Wellesley field trip in 2010, plus my own background. And I just wanted to go after this topic with gusto, find out what was happening around the country and look about, you know, can you teach about the world's religions without controversy? Can you teach about it and reduce religious literacy? Well, that's maybe a duh, but can you also teach about it and make a difference for religious minorities like me? Gotcha. And so you start off the book in a really interesting way. And the subtitle of the book, um, The Age of Intolerance, is a phrase that jumps out at me. And the book came out, (laughs) was it 2014 or 15? Came out in 2015, but it would have really gone to press. um, Trying to think. So if it came out in the summer of 2015, but I had to hand in my draft by. um, I I was handing in the, the whole book was like into my editor by August of 2014. Gotcha. So Trump, Trump was not a factor. Yeah, and I, and you know I I hate to go down the rabbit hole of that too much, but how do you oh, feel? Do. Okay, great. How do you feel about the age of intolerance with regard to religion over the past three to four years until 2018? Like, are you hopeful? <laughs> are you cynical? Like, because in the beginning of your book, you talk about the experience of watching um, children play these games, and now how you feel disturbed for the first time in a long time with regards to your own comfort in religion. So, how have things changed for you in the last four years? since you handed in the draft so i don't think they've gotten better (laughs) um you mean in terms of the the age of intolerance yeah for our nation Um, i mean i i think it's gotten worse um no doubt um but the thing to remember there have always 
been incidents of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia in our country. Mm-hmm. That's that. It's not new that the, the, the that these things are happening. I, I think that the ADL and other organizations, Southern Poverty Law Center, would say they've seen an increase since Trump was elected. It's almost like he opened the door <laughs> and somehow made it okay to be more intolerant. And there's certainly been the rise of the alt-right and white supremacist groups, you know, Charlottesville being a case in point. Uh, so there's that. On the positive side, I also think you, you're seeing mass protests with people saying, we don't, we don't want this. This isn't America. You know, we, we need to respect each other. You know, I, I think of the, you know, the marches that happened after the inauguration in January, and I actually did go with my husband and son. I'd never seen so many people <laughs> in one place wanting the world to be a better place. So, of course, that wasn't happening when I was writing my book. There were a lot of acts of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia happening as I was writing my book. So things have not changed. They have not gotten better. And yet I also think the awareness that these problems exist has grown since my book came out. Yeah. And, you know, I'm also thinking of an example that happened right here in Missouri in my hometown in St. Louis, where the Jewish cemetery in St. Louis was desecrated and there were like hundreds of tombstones that were tipped over. Yes, Um, I read that. Yeah. And so I'm I'm curious about, you know, what some of the the most prominent examples that you've seen have been with regards to this increase. Like what are some of the things that have like really like stuck with you? Uh, there have been so many. I'm, I'm going to think, um, <laughs> you know, and it's also international. It's not just here. Right. Europe is struggling big time. Yeah. I mean, when I, so <sighs> Charlottesville stands out, honestly, Yeah. because you had, these young, well, they weren't all young. You had these white men walking through the streets of Charlottesville holding tiki torches mm-hmm. and espousing hate against people of color, against Jews, um, you know, against anyone who wasn't white and Christian. And so that stands out the most. I don't see how it couldn't. But yet also what stands out is there were incidents in my own town. I mean, there have been so many I can't like pluck out one particular one. So, so there's the big national event, like what happened in Charlottesville, but then there's like, um, swastikas and anti-Semitic graffiti on the bathrooms in the local high school in my town. Yeah. So, and that's happening all over. So, so those are, I mean, I don't think anything's really quote unquote beaten Charlottesville, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is good. (laughs) Right. You know, I'm glad, you know, what happened after Charlottesville, there was a lot of, movement to stop them from holding those kind of rallies elsewhere. And I am a free speech advocate, so it's it's a struggle. Yeah. So let's dive into the book, Faith Ed, a little bit. Um, I have a favorite quote in the entire book, and to me it encapsulates the purpose of the book and studying religion. And the quote is this. Um, I took out a he said in the middle, but the quote is from a student. A human being should learn about other humans. And I love that quote. Um, what is your reaction to this stark, simplistic, and clear message of the student's words? You know, it almost makes me verklempt. <laughs> I don't know if you know that word. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, and and I and you know what's sad? I can't remember which student said it because they were all so great. Um, yeah. um I mean, I, I think that is part of learning about religion or race or, or things like that divide that divide us. I mean, we, we, we have to realize that we are all human and we have differences and it's okay and we should learn about those differences. You know, I, there, there is a uh, – my book I think is both complex and simple at the same time, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. I want I, – yes, I would like us all to get along, you know. Yeah. And, and it's not easy. <laughs> so the book is very special to me because I use it in my own classroom in a public school in Missouri. And I use it whenever I'm introducing my unit on Islam. And I have huh. the students read the case studies of Burqa Gate and yeah. about the kids visiting the mosque uh, on the middle school field trip and getting into the prayers with the men during the trip. And yeah. I have the students 
silently, so I give them the two articles on either side of the room, and um, not everybody has the same one. And I ask the students to read the article, and I ask them to think about the moment that got the teacher sort of like in trouble. Yes. And I ask the students questions about if they would do anything differently as a teacher to avoid getting in trouble. And the students often don't really think that like the teacher did anything wrong. They tend to side yeah. with the teacher pretty much across the board because they realize that like things happen. Um, and then they, you know, they also tend to mention in our discussions that I give field trips. My field trips are optional though because my students are yeah. seniors, and we go to the yeah. mosque, we go to the Hindu huh. temple, we go to synagogues, and we have two dozen guest speakers during the year. Um, yeah. So, um, what do you think about those case studies with regards to, um, you know, teaching about religion and how it can go so wrong in an instant? Yeah. So, let let let. Can I take one of them one at a time? You sure. Know, let, of course. Let's, so let's start with Wellesley. Um. So. Did the teachers actually make a wrong move on the field trip? Not really. Right. What 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 happened was it was a, a it was it was a situation of circumstance. There was two hundred kids in a mosque on a field trip. There were chaperones. There was a parent chaperone who had been sent in by a group that didn't like this mosque, and so they were looking for something to go wrong. And then there was this male worshiper not involved with the field trip. He was not an official tour guide. And he just went up to the boys sort of casually and said, hey, you want to come up? And and then the boys tried it out. And the chaperone took the video. And then months later, around the 9-11 anniversary, <laughs> you get this video that comes out that says, Wellesley, Massachusetts, public school students learn to pray to Allah. And then you have a controversy. Um what I think the teachers could have done differently or really the school was better emphasize before they went that the whole purpose of this was to observe and not participate, that mm -hmm. you are part of a public school. And so we're going to stand back and we're going to learn and we're going to watch, but you're not going to go up and pray with them. And so they learned that they need to be more careful when they go on field trips. The other aspect was the mosque also learned that they needed to take more precautions. And now when they have people do school, public schools only, when they do field trips, they'll go up to a viewing area above. Yeah. So there's no, so there's no risk. Um, I had a long conversation with Charles Haynes about this. He's um, with the First Amendment Center. And I also talked to some other religion scholars. And interestingly, there, there was some real discomfort on their part with schools taking field trips to houses of worship if there was active worship. Yeah. And because you, and this is, you know, there, there, this is not a black and white issue. There are very few black and white issues on this topic. Um, it is wrong to promote one religion over another. That's, you know, that's what the First Amendment talks about it. Well, it doesn't even say that. It just says, you know, no state shall establish a religion. That's really all it says, right? So, how do you then translate that into dealing with this topic? So if you go on a field trip, you don't, it's also about, you don't want to put kids in a position where they feel like you're pushing a particular religion on them. And once you start getting into ritual and stuff, then it becomes a little, you know, gray. Um, is it okay for them to go and watch a service as part of a public school field trip? Or maybe they just watch it on a video instead of going to a church or temple or something and being there during that religious service. Or if they want to go on their own later with their family and go and watch, that's something entirely different. So these were questions that came up. I don't think anybody ever resolved them. What I will say is Wellesley no longer goes to a place where there is active worship when they're there. Yeah. And I think for a public school system, it's probably, even though it's so wonderful to get to see it, I think that's probably the wisest choice because you just, you know, you, you want to avoid, well, what happens if you go to an evangelical church, right? Right. What are they, what are they preaching? I mean, I've been to evangelical churches. They want us all to be saved by Jesus. So that's going to be extremely uncomfortable for all of the, not just the non-Christians, but for anyone who doesn't believe in that particular thing. Um, and, and also a mosque too, you know, like 
it's okay to learn about what other people believe in their practices. But once you start getting into experiential learning, that's where it gets really kind of risky. So let's extend that experiential learning to Berkegate because yeah. this was a really interesting one because it took place <laughs> in the classroom yeah. at the school. There was no field trip involved. And uh, what do you think about this situation? Did the teacher do anything wrong? Um, because this was something that she'd been doing for decades, right? 15 years. Yeah. So so did she do anything wrong? I. I think, again, it's a gray area. There was no intentional malice in what she did. It was voluntary. But she was associating burkas with the same thing as trying on like a Mexican sombrero. Mm -hmm. And the thing was is she was kind of missing the point that there was religious significance to some extent to some of the items from Muslim Muslim majority countries, particularly the hijab. Um, You know, burka, you could argue that that's more of a cultural decision in Afghanistan Mm -hmm. than it is because you don't see all Muslims wearing burqas anywhere. (laughs) Um, It's, it's particular to the country. And she, I think the better route to take would be showing them, bring them into the class, lay them out on the table, let the kids come up and touch them and feel them. If they want to just hold them up and see what it's like, but don't, but, but encouraging them to put it on went a little bit, probably went a little bit too far. Um, did it merit the backlash of God? I don't know. Th- <laughs> um, the school district, by the way, supported her. They never said she did anything wrong. However, like Wellesley is not going to take kids back to the, a mosque where there's active worship. Lumberton High School in Texas is not going to have a teacher bring in a bag of clothing and have the kids try it on again. Right. You know, these <laughs> these examples to me, whenever I read them in the book, m- remind me of how delicate the job truly is that I have. Yes. And I ask the students, after they read these case studies that you've put in your book, I ask them, what is dangerous about being a teacher talking about religion? And through some some gentle conversation, the students in my class, who are all 17, 18 years old, they come to the conclusion that if they wanted to get me fired, they would likely be able to do it if they tried hard enough and if they, <laughs> and if they pushed far enough. Um, do you think that they are right, that if they really wanted to, that they could be successful in making that happen? I mean, I, I think, well, first of all, you're teaching elective class, I right? I am, yes. It's an elective. So those students are in there because they want to learn about different religions. Um, the, the biggest controversies tend to happen not in elective class. They usually happen in a class that all the kids must take. And if you look at the controversies in my book, that is every single class, it was a required class. So it wasn't an elective. Um, so you have families in there that aren't even really that aware their kids are learning about it. Um, I just, I just wanted to bring that up, but I, I think it would be tough. I mean, it, I mean, so the only way you could be like fired or really punished is if you were truly purposely intent, you know, if you were purposely promoting one religion, if you were trying to convert the kids or something like that, then you're, then you're violating a separation of church and state, asking kids to try on clothing, taking them on a field trip. I can't imagine that would lead to firing. Um, unless you intentionally did something wrong. So I, I'm not sure I agree with them. I mean, you might, you could land inadvertently land in a, land in a controversy because of something that happened on one of the field trips right? that you couldn't really control, but it happened. Like maybe you picked a place and you didn't know that this was a, a really over the top, uh, clergy person. Like maybe, maybe you, you went to one where like, the clergy person of whatever faith was like, we hate all Christians, we hate all Jews, wh- whatever. Right. You know, they said something anti-Semitic or anti-Christian or anti-Muslim, you know, and that happens. But even then, would they fire you? I don't know. I don't think so. So, yeah. And nobody's been fired. I- I'm trying to think in any of the cases that I wrote about, no one was fired. Okay. Yeah. And at the very least, you know, my... The, um life could get really unpleasant. And I imagine life yes. got very unpleasant for a lot of these teachers. Oh, yeah. You know, so Sharon Peters in Texas, she decided to retire early and she quit teaching. Yeah. And um, the Wellesley teachers, it was very stressful. 
mm-hmm. but nobody quit. And they had huge support from their school system and the parents. And uh, let me see, Kansas, nobody quit, but it was very, 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 very uncomfortable for a very long time. Tampa, Florida, where I spent some time and where it was the controversy dragged on for months and months and months. And the teacher, I think, got a death threat and strange calls. I, as far as I know, she's still teaching there, but it caused tension for a really long time. It caused a lot of stress. So I want to talk a little bit about some some positive things. So I have no doubt that lack of understanding about religion can make school a lonely place for a lot of kids. Like you have some really good anecdotes yeah. about kids who are Sikh, who are having like their turban pulled off and things like that. And it seems like the book kind of makes it um, a mission to see what schools are doing to reduce ignorance, which I think is amazing. What yeah. are some of your favorite examples of reduced ignorance that you saw during your research? Yeah, um, some of my favorite. Well, let's start with the Wellesley kids again, because I I did go back like a couple years later and interviewed some of the same kids I'd interviewed the first time around, and. Uh, let's start with Zen. So there was Zen from Easy. He's Muslim. And he had talked about experiencing some prejudice when he was in elementary school. And, you know, kids would say things like, oh, you got a bomb in your locker. And then he took the sixth grade class, loved it. And then in eighth grade, he, he, he gave me this example. He felt this was, by the way, he's now graduated from high school and he's in college. Cool. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so he gave me this example as he thinks it worked to reduce ignorance and increase respect. They had a substitute teacher come in. I think this was not long after the Boston Marathon bombing. And she went off on a rant on Muslims like, oh, they, you know, we should kick them out of the country, blah, blah, blah. And and then she changed her mind and stopped. The next day when the regular teacher came back, hands were up, going up all over the place. And several kids said, <clears throat> To the teacher, we want you to know what happened. We think it's wrong. That was really Islamophobic, and they wanted to talk about it. And to Zen, that was amazing because he didn't have to go first. Yeah, that the kids the kids learned how to be upstanders. So that that was a really good case of it there. Um, another one of my favorite stories, and I didn't actually interview the kid. This came from Sherry McIntyre, who was a teacher I spent time with in Modesto, California. They, by the way, never had a controversy. But she talks about running into a former student who was working at a store, and he told her the story, how someone in his family was saying prejudicial, incorrect things about Hindus. And he said he knew they were wrong because of what he had learned in her class. So he said something about it and stood up for it. And, you know, and said, hey, no, you're wrong. And let me tell you what I learned in class. So I think those two examples are pretty good examples. Yeah. Um, and an example that jumps out to me as well is you have an amazing story about a young woman, Alyssa, who was terrified yes. to stay in a room with religious yes. artifacts. Like she didn't want to be in a room with artifacts. Right. And then right. she she later learns that she doesn't have to shut others out to continue her own devotion to her faith. Yes. Which... I think is a lot of experience um, that my students have as well. So most of my students come in and they feel pretty strongly about something that they do. And they also aren't forced to be in my room. And most of them walk away um, with greater love for the world, which I think is amazing. And they also aren't walking away from the things that they hold dear. Um, So my students aren't forced to be there. The students in Modesto are forced to be there. Um, just for one example, w- which way do you think is ideal? Should students have to or should they choose it? So I don't think it's um, an either or. I think, first off, if you look at state standards around the country, most states require students to learn about the world's religions mm-hmm. as part of social studies or geography. And I think, of course, I think learning about the world's religions should be a part of everyone's education. So, yes, I think every student should be required to learn about the world's religions. Does it need to be like a 
a pull-out class or a separate class, not necessarily. If it's taught well within a typical world history, social studies, geography class, I think that's perfectly fine. I think the important thing is that they learn about the existence of different world religions. They learn about some of the similarities and differences, the history, um, you know, what are the core beliefs, you know, they, they, that they get a sense of what are these different religions in the world, some of the history behind the tensions as well as non-tension. <laughs> um, so yes, I think it should be required, but I think having an elective course that digs much deeper than you can in a required course is also terrific. Most, most of these required courses generally don't have the bandwidth to dig as deep as you might in an elective course. I think Wellesley is a rare exception. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, Wellesley goes deeper than Modesto. Modesto is only a nine week class and they spend like a week on a religion. Yeah. So what about age? Because one of the things that really stood out to me was the contrast between the freshman students and like the juniors or the seniors. So you have a lot of juniors or seniors that failed the class freshman year in the book, but then they loved it the second time around. Like, do you think that some of the um, districts... Not should... a lot. Oh, not a lot? No, it's not that many. Okay. No. Well, I guess there's just a few. Maybe I'm overblowing it. Um, yeah, there's a few examples. <laughs> should, like, do you think that the, from, from being in these rooms, do you think that it would be more useful if the students were older across the board? Because, like, they could go maybe deeper in the content and, like, see, like, the connection to the greater world as, like, with more of an adult mindset? Uh, no. Um, what I think is, is that you start teaching them something in elementary school and then you keep building on it. And like you might do more in sixth grade and then you do more in ninth or 10th grade. And then maybe you can do a deeper, an even deeper class later. I think you have to kind of do it over the years as it fits in the curriculum. Um, I have a chapter, I think, believe it was titled how young is too young. Oh yeah. And they're teaching first graders about the world's religions in a fairly simple way. And I thought it was a great way to do it. And then they do more in second grade where they might add on Hinduism. And then they do more in fourth grade where they talk about the spread of Islam historically. And then they do more as you go. And like the first graders may not remember everything, but it, but, but a seed has been planted. They understand that mine is not the only religion. They understand that not everybody celebrates Christmas, <laughs> you yeah. know? Um, so, cause there's two, there's two purposes to teaching about the world's religions. One is to reduce ignorance and one is, you know, reduce ignorance and improve religious literacy. The other is to reduce intolerance. And if you wait until they're juniors or seniors to teach about the world's religions, I think that's too late. By then, tons of us have experienced fairly extreme prejudice and discrimination and, you know, a lot of bullying because of our religion. And a lot of that is due to ignorance. I also would add that the Wellesley Social Studies Chair writes a letter to parents every year about the start of the course and why they do it. And he makes some beautiful points about why doing it in sixth grade is pretty important. And, and one is, is that that's the time when a lot of kids start having rites of passage in their own religion. Oh, cool. It's, it's also the time when a lot of bullying gets more intense. Yeah. So it's so it's it. I think I don't think there's an either or. I think you, you know, like Charles Haynes has has written a, a lot a, a lot about this over the years. It's the idea of putting it in the curriculum over the years, and you may do it differently depending on the age group. But religion crosses against almost every period of history in some way, and kids learn about history. It, like sometimes they'll learn about U.S. history or their own state's history. Sometimes they learn about, you know, world history. When you're learning even about like the history of Massachusetts, you would talk about the Puritans. So religion really wraps itself into everything, whether it's literature, science, social studies. So I think you can't just wait until a certain point to teach it. I think having those deeper conversations like you probably have in your class, that would be for older kids. You have to do what's age appropriate. Yeah. And build them up over time, it seems like, would be the best way to do it. Um, exactly. And you know, what's really interesting about that is I'm making some new connections here because throughout the year, whenever we start a new unit, I ask the students, like, we have conversations about what do you already know? And yeah. it's striking how often they say, 
nothing. Who? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and so uh, now totally. I'm, now I'm thinking about all those missed opportunities in the younger years right. that would lead to the students coming in with more. And a lot of them come in with a lot from 10th grade, but a lot of them do say, I know nothing. And that's kind of like kicking me in the, in the teeth right now, um, which I'm loving. Can we talk about Charles Haynes for a second? Sure. <laughs> so Charles Haynes from the First Amendment Center said that he would take more risks in writing the course curriculum. Uh-huh. And um, what kind of experimentation do you think that he would like to see in in the uh, courses? You know, I, I can't speak for Charles, so I don't know. Um, hold on. <laughs> I mean, what I do know, excuse me, um, what I do know is one of the things he talked to me about at one point was this idea of having religion religion taught across the curriculum, what I was just talking about earlier. So I don't know if that's a risk. Um, yeah. So beyond that, but I, I don't really know what he's referring to. So you'd have to ask him. Sorry. Gotcha. So there is like a really specific like curriculum binder. Um, and the teachers are paranoid of controversy, which rightly so. Um, and I have to say, these exact thoughts cross my mind a lot in the last few years, and I can't tell if I've done a great job at avoiding controversy or if I'm just lucky. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, Greg, you know what? Um, I just thought of something. Cause so Charles Haynes did talk about taking more risks to me in context of the Modesto curriculum. Okay, that, that's what I mean. What do you think that he, what, what do you think he would suggest? Uh, yeah, and I know, and I do know exactly what he was talking about. <laughs> okay, so let me give a little background, if that's okay, first about sure. Modesto. Um, so Modesto's curriculum, they're pretty strict. They don't allow um, no field trips, no guest speakers. Um, they don't allow heavy discussion. It's very much kind of here's the facts, ma'am, with some videos to supplement things. They do talk about the First Amendment, which is terrific. Um, but, you know, I sat in the classes and, and, like, you have someone like Sherry, and she's a very – Sherry McIntyre, very dynamic teacher. She's a really good teacher. But they, but there's just not a lot of um, debate over anything or discussion, and and then you go to Wellesley, where they're teaching about um, a controversy over the building of a mosque in Tennessee, and I think that's like as a way to talk about stereotyping and things like that, and it's a lot more intense and exciting kind of lesson than just here are the core beliefs, here's this, here's that, et cetera. So I think allowing kids to have discussions, moderated discussions should be a part of any kind of education. And he felt like Modesto was too much on the facts and not allowing enough for some discussion. Gotcha. Do so, you, did, did the students in the courses that you observed, did they seem like hyped up or excited about the content or did it seem like any old class to them where this like notes and like tests and stuff like that like were the students excited about the material so in modesto or and uh, i guess uh, let's let's start with modesto okay so modesto she was teaching like five to six classes a day of 39 to 40 students that's a lot yeah so some of them look like totally zoned out Um, I saw kids with heads on their desk and other ones looked somewhat interested. And I interviewed, I probably interviewed 20 to 30 students and then interviewed past students. And some of them were really excited. Um, Some of the students who had graduated said they wish they had gone deeper, but they were happy to have the course and they liked the course. So it kind of ran the gamut, but you had, you know, I think you probably have half the students who are kind of tuned out because it's a required class and, there's 40 kids in the class, and they're just not that engaged. And then you have other students who are really interested. So it just, it, I think the class is, you know, I don't think there's anything you can do about it, but 40 kids is a heck of a lot. Yeah. So I think it, I didn't see a, like, extreme excitement in the Modesto classes, uh, but probably that's because of the way they're set up. In Wellesley, Every time I walked into the classroom, there was good discussion going on. He moved the kids around. They worked in cooperative groups on things. It was, it wasn't just that he was a good teacher. It was how they taught in the sixth grade at Wellesley Middle School. And it was cooperative learning. But I think there was only 25 kids in the class. That's a lot easier. And even that's not tiny, but it's, it's easier to work with 25 than 40. 
Um, but it was also the material, you know, like they went on field trips. He did things like let's discover the mosques around the world. And they would use like the computers to do research and work in groups. And the kids were so excited about that. They also would go home and do interviews with people of different religions. So it was a very engaging, exciting class. So say that there's some teachers out there who are listening to this who are interested in, you know, maybe teaching elective or um, required yeah. courses about religion in the future in their own careers. What are some of the best like training opportunities or professional development chances that you've come across that would be useful for teachers out there to investigate? So there are a number of things that have popped up over the years. Um one thing I would check to see what the museum religion in DC is offering both online and in person. And they tend to do a pr something where they would also teach you about the first amendment, but they would also have speakers come in of different religions. So definitely look at what they're doing. I would look at the Tannenbaum center in New York city that I believe has a summer program or the interfaith. There's also an interfaith center in New York city. Um, and then Harvard Divinity School through Diane Moore offers some trainings for teachers and summer institutes, and they have the online, I don't know if you've seen it, the, the free MOOCs, <laughs> the free online courses on religious literacy. Yeah, I took the Hinduism and Buddhism through scriptures courses from Harvard online. It was great. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, so that, those are more content I think in terms of learning about approach and kind of activities and stuff, I would look at, uh, you know, museum religion. Oh, also the pluralism project at Harvard has a wealth of resources for teachers. So those are, those are some of the places I would check out. Awesome. Thank you. So some of the one of the profiles in the book that was really capturing my attention was the evangelical teacher that you profiled who teaches about world religions. And I love the idea of teachers dissecting their own worldview and seeing how it impacts their teaching. And one example that springs to mind is I had a guy, a guy on this show named Kevin Singer. And he's a professor, and he's an evangelical, and he loves teaching about world religions. And we talked about that on my show, how he is an evangelical, what he gets from other religions. And he seemed like somewhat lonely um, because he didn't see a lot of his fellow evangelicals studying other religions. So when you talk to teachers and students about the effects of their worldview after studying world religions, what are like the biggest takeaways? Like how do teachers navigate this space of can, taking their own worldview into consideration and not letting it um, impact too much their objectivity? So it depended on the place. Like in Wellesley, I didn't run across any evangelical teachers. Um there were certainly Christian teachers who taught, but they weren't evangelical. And they sort of had, their social studies chair often had meetings with them. And I think they talked about the importance of keeping your own faith out of it as much as possible. Um, and really, you know, really it's not about you. Um, and you're not, you're not supposed to preach a particular point of view. You need to be objective about the different religions. And so like, I know like for Jonathan Rabinowitz at Wellesley, like he, he sometimes had to like be sure he wasn't, playing favorites towards Judaism because he knew a lot about it. But he he, he went on um, an exchange program, I think, with teachers from Jordan and learned a lot about Islam. So he really pushed himself to get out of his own Jewish bubble because he admitted he grew up in a Jewish bubble, interestingly, because, you know, it can work all different sorts of ways. In Modesto, like, so one of the teacher I happened to follow doesn't really subscribe to any particular religion. So it wasn't really a relig uh, it wasn't an issue for her. She says she loves all religions and but then I did interview this other teacher there who is more evangelical and he for him it's a banner of pride that he doesn't say what his religion is and that some of the students at the end think he's Buddhist, <laughs> you know. Interesting, so, yeah. So what I think where the teacher struggled the most was at the elementary level in Kansas. A, a good chunk of them were very, very religious Christians and had not known a lot about Islam and it was a stretch for them to teach about Islam. 
and they were not necessarily very open-minded about other religions and they were being asked to teach this curriculum that they didn't ask for. So that was probably the biggest challenge. And, and I, I presume that happens in a lot of places where there are teachers who just didn't know that they were handed this and didn't know that much about it and were very nervous about it. And that's where places like First Amendment Center and others can come in and kind of save the day. Did you have any favorite moments during the research process, like a day that jumps out at you as like, wow, that was a great day? You know, um, there's probably more than one. Um, but I will say it was – so I got invited to go on the field trip to Epcot with the World Religions class in Tampa. And I didn't really I – I had planned initially to connect with this girl – Oh my gosh. Oh, Hepa. Hepa Hussein. And and it turns out her best friend was Jewish and the two of them were going to tour Epcot together. And one of the really amazing experiences was going with them as they went through the Morocco exhibit and Hepa was explaining all the things that she knew because she was her family was actually Palestinian. Um but she knew like the spices were familiar to her. The architecture was familiar because Morocco is a majority Muslim country with a lot of Islamic architecture. So she was so excited to show her friend who was Jewish, all this stuff. And they were kind of learning from each other. And it was just, I still remember that as one of the more special moments. And it was also, I remember writing it almost like a little story on its own and then reading it to my son who at the time was only four or five years old, maybe. Um, now he's 10. <laughs> and he loved the story. He could connect to this idea of a Jewish kid and a Muslim kid kind of learning from each other. And he thought it was cool. Um, but I just remember, wow, if the whole world was like that, what a better place it would be. Um, so I really like that story. And they were thrown together. They had met in the world history class where they were learning about world religions. What about some of the greatest challenges you faced when putting together the book? Um, I would say one of the big challenges was getting some of the teachers to be willing to tell their story to me because a number of them were caught in these huge national controversies and they had not spoken publicly. So it took me quite a while to convince the uh, Tampa teacher to let me come out there and talk to her. I just kept kept on it. And then, and then the same thing with the Texas teacher. I didn't hear from her initially, and I was like worried that wasn't even going to happen. I mean, I would have had to work around it, but the but the stories would not have been as compelling if I didn't have the teacher, those teachers. Wellesley, Wellesley also wasn't initially like, yeah, come in. It took me like, but it only took like three or four weeks with them, whereas it took like six months, I think, to get permission from Tampa, and it took a while from the Texas one. I think Tampa was the last place I went to because it took so long to make that happen. So those were some of the challenges, getting people willing, getting, getting people who had been in the crossfire, getting, getting them to be willing to share their stories. And, and I did have some people bail on me, not teachers. I actually had, um, well, they didn't bail. They said I couldn't use their name after I interviewed them. But thankfully my editor was like, you can still use them. Just we won't use their names. Okay, so that was another one of my questions, um, because I was amazed. I was really drawn to Sherry McIntyre in the book. Like, yeah. I think Sherry McIntyre and I would be great friends in real life, and um, I was amazed. I that, do understand that. Yeah. <laughs> She's awesome. <laughs> and, and I and I was surprised that I found her instantly online at a TED Talk she gave in Modesto, and yeah. I was like, okay, these are not pseudonyms. These are like people actually yes. putting themselves out there. Yes. Well, so remember, I'm a journalist. Yeah. I, I would say I've almost never written a story where I don't use a person's real name. And I strongly believe in authenticity. And I actually get annoyed when I read books where they've made stuff up. Um, a nonfiction book where they've actually made some stuff up because somebody wouldn't talk to them or where they change the names. And sometimes those names are changed to protect somebody. But these teachers didn't need protection. Um, their stories had been out publicly and not all their names had been there. But to me, that was part of it, like being willing to tell your story. And if I said it was Jane Smith, I think it 
I think it would be less of a, it would have made less of an impact. Yeah. Everyone in this, every, everybody in the book is real. <laughs> if you were, so it, let, let's switch. That, your hat. That's, that's what I do. Yeah. You know? So let's switch your hat for a second. If you were a teacher and you had free reign over the creation of a religious studies class, what would you put in it? Which religions or what kind of activities? Like, or... like, how would you structure the class? Like, what would you want to do? Like, what kind of experiences would you seek to create for the people in the classes? So uh, one thing I would want to see is definitely not just giving the facts. I mean, yes, you have to teach the facts, but allowing the kids to have some discussions over the issues that religion causes in society. I mean, when people ask me, are you a religion writer? And I said, well, sort of, but really what I am is I write about the intersection of religion with public life. And so I, I would, you know, first make sure they learn about the different religions and what, the, what they are. You can't learn about all of them. So you've got to pick and have them learn about, you know, at least some major world religions and then talk about how they play out in current events, like the debate in France over whether women can wear a hijab. You know, what does that mean? Or church and state teach about the first amendment and what does that mean? And, it, but, but have discussions. So they're able to actually discuss, discuss it. Also, first and foremost, include something and Wodesto does this, Wellesley does this, include some instruction about how do you talk about a religion you're, you, you're unfamiliar with with somebody else who actually practices that religion? Like, how can you be respectful when you are talking about religion? Because one of the biggest problems in our country is we just like bash each other. And so, how you know, teaching, taking the time to teach kind of decorum, <laughs> you know, like, like some rules of the conversation. And, and that comes from talking about racism as well, you know, race as well. There, there, there's some parallels there. So those are some things. In terms of activities, you know, do I recommend field trips? Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I do. Um, even though the problems can happen, I think trying to go to some different houses of worship brings the education alive for the students. So if you can do it, do it but also make sure you can show the diversity even within those religions. And you can do that through the Discover the Mosque Around the World exercise. There are many different ways to do it. You just need to make clear that this is just one example of many examples within this faith. And I'm trying to think if there was something else. Um, I think it's perfectly fine to bring in things to show or use videos or something. Because if you can't take them on the field trips, you, need, you know, bring it alive for them. It would be good for students to know how to, how to behave when you're going into a mosque or a temple or a Hindu temple or a church, like, or going to a Catholic mask and you're Jewish. Like, what do I do? Do I go up and accept the, um, <laughs> you know, communion or am I supposed to stay, stand back? What do I do? And so, I would love to see that be a part of it, some practical teaching. Nice. Um, so, you know, we, we talked earlier about how this was sort of like a later career discovery for you, like writing yeah. about religion in the classroom. What sorts of joy have studying about other religions brought to your personal life? Like, how are you different now? Um. So I would say that I was never totally ignorant about other religions, partly because my mother taught English as a second language when I was growing up. And so we had people from around the world come to our house and a lot of them were Muslim or Buddhist or Baha'i or, you know, so I, I, I'm a big reader. I wouldn't say I knew a lot about different religions, but I wasn't totally ignorant. Number one. Yeah. Um, but I do feel like working on this book made me, a lot more educated on a lot of different religions. Um, one of the most joyous experiences was visiting the Sikh temple of Modesto. I knew nothing about Sikhism. I had read a little bit. Um, and I actually talked to a Sikh here before I went just to kind of get a sense of what to expect. But I remember going to the temple on the and getting a tour, interviewing kids and then getting a tour from the principal and then being encouraged to just sit in the service and watch a little. And then... Um, she insisted that I stay for the Langar, which is like the community meal. And just, you know, sort of having this this sense that, 
yes, religions are all very different, and yet there's there's some similar element that they're all about creating community. And that was just sort of a neat, <laughs> neat moment. Um, I think also sort of rambling here, but another really joyous moment was I spent a lot of time with Hassan Shibley. He was an imam and a head of the care group in Florida that was under fire. And he took me on a tour of several different mosques in the Tampa area and sort of gave me sort of a crash course in the diversity of Islam in just one city. And I just that was amazing. That was an amazing experience to learn that and to see the different, see the different architecture, and yet see that in every mosque, you know, there's a mirab and there's this and there's that. Just like in every Jewish temple, you're going to see the ark that holds the Torahs. Um, so it, yeah. So there was a lot of joy of discovery. And I know that the book is coming out on Audible now, right? It, it's already out. It came out uh, on audio. And Audible uh, in February, so Excellent. it's now yeah it's available in audio, it's available ebook, and paperback and hardcover. Awesome. Well, Linda, this has been a spectacular hour. I am so grateful to you for taking some time out of your very busy schedule to talk to me for Classical Ideas. Well, thank you so much for having me, Greg. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks. Classical Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is performed and composed by Derek Striving. You can find his music at www.wearewarmmusic.com. If you would like to support this show, please subscribe or leave a rating in iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.